بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم الحمد لله everybody still with me I would like first to begin by giving thanks and recognition to our indigenous communities uh, we are on their land and we can't continue to be in this country without actually giving recognition to those who have suffered and continue to suffer from the ravages of 500 years of colonization. So we stand in here in complete recognition and solidarity with all of our indigenous communities. The second is as immigrants, voluntary immigrants for the most part, we can't speak without also giving recognition to our black communities who for the most part came in the holes of ships as cargo. And they had to endure not only the enslavement in West Africa, but had to endure the Middle Passage, and they had to endure the continuity of the suffering even till today where we have more of our black brothers and sisters in jail than in Yale. That is something that we as Muslims have to be constantly give recognition and understanding of it. Third, yesterday was an important birthday. Our brother Malcolm's birthday was yesterday. Uh, today he would be 98 years old. And if you just think about what would have been the impact of every leader of the civil rights movement that was around, continued to live and live their natural life and contribute their ideas, their thoughts, their impact. Because every part of the civil rights movement, the leadership, either they were killed, were sent to jail, or went to exile. And therefore, whenever we think of what we see in the streets of America, we have to consider what is a leaderless community looks like because it was structural that this community had to face these ravages. So I don't want to put a downer on us because I want us to celebrate. I want you to all thank yourself and give yourself really a round of applause for what you built. You have 125 mosques in this region. Let me repeat, 125 mosques that you built. Somebody could correct me, there's only one mosque that was funded externally. Which means 124 mosques you as a community your brothers, your sister, your mother, your auntie, your cousin, your Rolodex, at the time where we actually used to write phone numbers, you have managed to build these 124, and I'll add the 125 institutions. That is a monumental task. That's a task that countries often can't undertake, but you did it in almost 30 years. Let me repeat, 30 years. The council is 28. We could add, again, some more years. I come from Northern California. We, right now, we have 92 mosques in Northern California. Now, let me give you the uh, perspective on history. In 1985, in Northern California, there were only three mosques. Only three mosques. You had no choice. Either you go and pray in a uh, mosque in uh, Upper Mission, you could go down to Santa Clara, San Jose, there was a mosque, or if you have enough gas, you could drive all the way up to Sacramento. You had no choice. You did not say, is this a Shia mosque, can I pray there? Is this a Sunni mosque that I could pray there? Are these Malikis, Shafi'is, Hanafis, or Qul al Madhab? You had no choice. You had to get to the car to find a mosque to pray, and more importantly, if somebody from your family died, you need to find the mosque to actually go there to try to have somebody that is able to wash, because not everybody knew how to wash a body, to try to get the coffin. You didn't know whether to go to Macy's or any shroud will do, and you didn't know what to do. 
Today, I say that we have all types of Muslims. We have the fully leaded Muslims, unleaded, supreme, and vegetarian. <laughs> That's so much so that you actually make choice of where you want to, oh, I want to go to that mosque for Ramadan because they have a speedy Gonzalez reader that finishes the, the juz in half an hour. <laughs> Come on, admit it. I know that. Uh, I know that our Qari, beautiful Qari, I know people will not be around them for Ramadan. They will do a two rak'ah and then they have to go to the dessert table. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that we have managed to make transformation in our community by building institutions. Under extreme odds, very extreme odds that we faced, you know, if you just think about as Muslims, we can't afford to be disconnected and to say we have nothing to do with people out there. All right? For a while, people will say, don't talk to me about what's happening over there. Well, over there is now over here. I say that because America was over there, we are, we are here. Before the invasion of Iraq, we didn't have large Iraqi communities. I compare it. If you came to the United States in 1970, there wasn't a Korean or Vietnamese communities substantial numbers. The United States intervention in Vietnam, now you have some of the best Vietnamese food you could ever have as a result of the intervention. What am I saying? As Muslim communities in America, we're facing major challenges. Some are internal and some external. Again, internal, we still can't get along. Let's be very clear. We need to find a way for us to get along with difference, to get along with difference with a strategic map forward. If you don't have a strategic map, you basically are going to follow what Fox News tell you, and you begin to be reactionary to whatever modes of communication that has taken place out there. So we have to have our ability to be united with difference. If you actually look at this room, we have possibly the most diverse community you could have, with the exception possibly going to Hajj. In the Bay Area, I know because I did the Bay Area Muslim study, right, with 1,100 uh, uh, survey and five focus groups. In one mosque, there's 80 different nationalities. 80 different nationalities. Most, most of the community actually speaks more than three languages. In one of the mosques, there are 600 PhDs. In one mosque, if you take it to some Muslim countries, that will actually constitute the intelligentsia. All right? So what we have is the challenge of how to actually be strategic in our planning, our leadership development, our programs for our community in order for us to face these challenges that are facing us. Now, many of you know that I work on Islamophobia, right? We used to face Islamophobia from one segment. Now it's, I would say, they have just adopted, we are facing it from everywhere. You have the Islamophobia of the political right. You have Islamophobia that's coming from the political left, because again, Muslims are, you are not as progressive on these cultural issues. Then increasingly today, for those who are following the development with the Hindutva, we're actually having an organized Hindu nationalist opposition inside the country in here. And if you followed the debate in the state of California on SB 403, the Hindutva activists were actually mobilizing to try to maintain caste discrimination in the state of California. So Hindutva activists, the American Hindu Foundation, and for those who, we did a full report, so we're actually facing that challenge in there. The only way for us out is for us to be united. The way out is for us to be united, to have a strategic plan, to have a strategic village, vision, to have a development uh, in a way that will make a qualitative difference. Now let me give you another perspective as well spiritually. We're here not because of our, any of our own uh, volition, 
even if we think that uh, our black brothers who were brought in here in enslavement, it's Allah has a plan. Allah has a plan. Right? I tend to feel, or at least to reflect, what Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ For the Prophet وسلم, that we have exalted your name or your fame, that is us in here, that Allah made this plan, because there is no way that you could think that you were in Kujurat and you think that you're going to be in Southern California making a living. Or me as a Palestinian coming out thinking that I'm going to be here. Or if you are from any part, from Pakistan, from Turkey, from Nigeria, from Mali, from Senegal, from Somalia, from Bosnia, you would not have thought that you're going to be in this country, in this place, the furthest out from Mecca, and that you're going to actually set up a mosque and pray and begin to have Hufad coming out of this society. You would not have thought about it. And for our black community, 15 to 30 percent of those enslaved were Muslims. You need to understand that 15 to 30 percent of all the enslaved people that were brought to America were Muslims. That's your history. The only surviving document in the handwriting of enslaved people is in Arabic. It's either a Quranic text or a Maliki, Maliki Islamic law. You could go to the Library of Congress. The full biography of Umar ibn Sa'id in Arabic.